So let me just um, tie in one piece. Uh, Ahmed answered a question in terms of the three schools that were at the bottom of that list because it was the lowest cost. And, and there's a distinction between the recommendation from Plant Moran from a facility cost perspective and a recommendation that might ultimately go to the board. They're, they're two very different things. There's been no determination that those are the three buildings that would be recommended to the board ought to remain because there are many other pieces that have to be looked in that context. That recommendation was solely in the context of the cost of doing the necessary repairs. Those three buildings, those total costs was about a million two, which is about what's anticipated might be available for a reallocation in the current bond program. So it would not require additional cost. Um, Paul showed you uh, uh, what it might look like if you went to a K-4 and added building, added to uh, the Kennedy building. Clearly that would require additional expenditures of funds well beyond the million two that might be available for reallocation. So that would require quite likely another bond issue in order to do that. So with that in mind, let's just talk about where can we get savings from. And as we've looked at these buildings, um, we can see that if we can reduce the footprint and right size the footprint, that we could anticipate savings and custodial maintenance costs somewhere between three hundred and nine hundred thousand dollars. We also believe that if we were to close an elementary building, depending upon which building, that the savings that the district would realize would be somewhere between three hundred and five hundred thousand dollars. When you reconfigure buildings and you put larger number of kids together in a building to make better use of it. You can reduce the number of staff that's required to provide programming for those same kids because you have a larger number of kids that you can allocate to, uh, to each classroom. So staff savings, three to $400,000, that's about four positions uh, across the district. Uh, in building closures, again, depending upon which building, saving somewhere between $150,000, $500,000 total million one to 2.3 million depending upon which buildings are ultimately focused on uh, plus any revenue generated from the sale of a building that might be determined no longer being necessary for the district. When you look at maintenance and operational cost and, and there's a reason why the district focused through their plant Moran study on the facilities is because we're clearly outliers in terms of operational expense for the buildings in contrast to our cohort group to the tune of about a million two hundred thousand dollars per year. Yes, sir. Sure. Four. Yep. That, that's their average salary. That does not include fringe benefits. It doesn't include the Social Security or the retirement costs that go with it. The district's projections that as a teaching position cost them about $100,000 a year with all of those other costs. And that's fairly consistent across the area. Okay? So when you look at the operational cost, a million one, a uh, million two, higher than our cohort tells us that we're spending of the dollars we receive and that non-instructional support a significantly higher portion of the dollars for non-instructional issues instead of being able to reallocate those dollars to the classroom. When you look at closing an elementary building, the savings from the office, the savings from the operations and the utilities estimated to be $503,000 per building, again, depending upon which building is ultimately determined. There's variance there. Here's the view on the staffing issue. When you look at the current situation, the number of sections you would have, if you adopted one of the configuration models that Plant Ran laid out, uh, two elementary buildings, uh, a middle school that's K-8, and a high school that's 9-12, you would wind up with about four fewer teaching positions than what you currently experience and the district's calculation again is $100,000. That equals about 51 student increase. You'd have to have 51 more students in the district to generate those same level of savings. So when you look at the challenges that the district faces, 
if they do nothing, they have to look at where they're going to get two and a half million dollars from. How is that going to come? Question about what are you doing to try to attract kids and hold on to the kids you have. They're looking at new and innovative programs like adding a Montessori program, like adding a Cambridge component to the uh, elementary schools, looking at an early college program that I believe was just approved last evening by the Board of Education to try to provide more programs and services for kids and parents, is along, parents along the way. The challenge is how do you right size the district? Technically, if you look at the footprint of this facility, this facility is large enough to accommodate every student in the district. You could, to get to that full utilization, close every building and leave only this building open. Nobody's looking at that. But I tell you that just as an indicator as to how much excess capacity from a building perspective that exists in the district. So when the district looks at where do we go to be able to increase the funds that we spend for instructional purposes, it makes sense to say if we have excess capacity that we don't need, let's look at a reconfiguration model that still keeps the separation of ages for kids, elementary, middle school, and high school along the way but let's do it in the most cost-effective way that we possibly can. Uh, and then secondly, uh, finally, let's talk about how do we increase the percentage of eligible students who reside in the district into preschool programs. We know that preschool programs have a significant positive instructional benefit for kids as they matriculate through school on an ongoing basis. So we wanna try to increase the number of students that are here who have the ability to take advantage of the instructional benefits of that preschool program, but also to be able to say, once we get them here, if we can provide a quality program, we're likely to be able to keep them and help diminish the loss of kids along the way. So those are the challenges when we talk about how might you deal with them. And again, we're, we're at a beginning stage. We're looking at options and we're looking for feedback in terms of options along the way. But one seems fairly obvious to us that doesn't impact kids directly, and that's to move the central office building out of the Harding building to this facility. It increases the utilization at this building and it reduced costs for the district uh, at about $140,000 a year. It would allow the district to look at repurposing that Harding facility uh, and or to consider selling it. Um, in the enrollment office that's currently located at Harding, uh, uh, a location for that can be determined uh, as we move through this process. A question a few minutes ago about the CASA program. Uh, at this stage, nothing would change with CASA. The, the um, consortium arrangement with the CASA program with the other districts has just been renewed for a new five-year period of time, and that new lease included some improvements for the Ferndale perspective. Uh, prior to this point, Ferndale was on the hook for all of the capital improvements on their own. Now those capital improvements will be shared by all of the districts equally. And then thirdly, um, a commitment was made that Ferndale would look to decrease their operational costs, the custodian utility costs of the facility, recognizing that Ferndale is an outlier in contrast to the other districts along the way. Long story short, CASA stays the same. When you look at alternative education, there are some goals. Uh, number one, to increase the quality of our, the adult ed program. And secondly, not relying upon, in quotes, profit from the alternative uh, ed program for budgeting purposes. We've seen the precipitous drop and we've seen a continual drawback of state funds for those programs. They reduced it 20% this year. We think that it's a mistake to count on those programs to try to maintain the, the base program that we run in the district. And then finally, find options to try to lessen the economic impact of the alternative ed program. How do we do that, provide quality programs, uh, and do it in an effective manner? When we look at alternative ed, adult ed, facility recommendations, there are some options. Uh, one option might be to say, you know, let's leave Taft alone and use the first floor for the career center, use the second floor for adult and alternative ed, and the, the lower level, the slide says basement, I don't like that term, the lower level, um, as an online or virtual alternative ed center and close Jefferson. That might be an option. If that option were to be pursued, it would save the district approximately $200,000. 
uh, career and adult ed grant funds would pay for the custodial maintenance costs. The district would still need to pay for any capital expenses. It's a 1920s building, and the estimates from Plant Moran is that they would have to spend about a half a million dollars over the next five years to maintain the level and the integrity of that facility. A and then the other aspect that needs to be considered is the community concerns with that alternative ed program returning to that neighborhood and the increased traffic with the career center. A second option is to say, let's just lease space for our adult and alternative ed center. That lease could be done with another public entity or it could be done with a private entity. It would allow the district to close both Taft and Jefferson totally. If that option were to be pursued, the district would realize savings between three and four hundred thousand dollars, plus if they chose to sell one or both of those buildings, whatever the sale of those buildings brought would be an additional benefit to the district. Uh, the district can lease space uh, appropriate to the size of the program as it changes from year to year, um, and, and it allows them to adjust with the funding from the state one way or the other. It allows for the possible redevelopment of the Taft building and or uh, property sale for housing development, so, uh, strengthening the Dales community, and. Uh, increasing the property values. Uh, Paul had shown you a list of the estimate of the, the values of the property and the number of um, residential lots that could be included on either one of those. And, and then any profit from the sale of the building could go towards dealing with some of those major maintenance issues that Ahmad talked about at other facilities uh, that the district would, would maintain. Yes? Sure. Sure. Yes, absolutely. And and when we talked about you know a lease of the building, remember I said either public and or private options could be pursued. Could be either way. You bet. So a third option that could be looked at as it relates to adult ed would be to say um, move adult ed into the first floor of the grant building. And, and again, that assumes that the ownership of the grant building is transferred out of the district's control to. Uh, someone else and then lease the space back from um, whoever own, owns or operates grant at that particular time. Uh, and tied to that then would be the alternative ed, the virtual piece, uh, would lease three or four classrooms somewhere else, either public or private facility as well. So here's some, some considerations with option three projected three to $400,000 on savings plus the sale of property that might come from it. The adult lease funds could help sustain the grant building for the township. Um, adult debt is self-sustaining, not out of the general ed fund, can't pay for capital improvements with dollars that are generated there. Would be less than what adult debt is paying for Jefferson. Adult funding was cut, again, 20% by the state. Possible redevelopment of the Taft building and or property for family housing and any profit could go to the maintenance of other buildings along the way. When we look at preschool, how do we deal with preschool? We think there are some options there that can be considered as well. One is to relocate all preschool to Harding. If we move the central office building out of Harding over here, Harding could easily handle all of the existing preschool programs and have room for future growth of that program. Hopefully we can get more um, percentage of those four-year-olds into that program. We'd save operational costs at grant of about 170,000. We'd have less long-term capital expenses at Harding. Grant needs a million three. Harding is substantially less than that. It allows for expanding programs, provides more comparable options to neighboring districts. Busing would have to be provided by the district. The location at Harding would provide easy access for parents who commute close to the freeway. And it would provide for a year-round and wraparound care that we don't currently have. So pluses and some minuses with each of these options that need to be looked at. Option two with the preschool would be to close Harding altogether and relocate the Harding preschool to the elementary programs divide those programs up and send those preschool programs to the remaining elementary school. It would allow Harding to be sold, uh, about $140,000 operational uh, savings plus whatever the sale of the building would bring. One of the downsides is the elementary principals would have to become 
certified to supervise a preschool program. That's a state state law, and so there would be some expense in doing that. And it would be um, less potential for future growth because of the other programs that are in those typical elementary schools. It would provide preschool in different areas of the district, and people would have to look at which building am I going to and where am I sending my kids to for preschool. It would have about a million three in capital expenses at grant within one to three years. That's a downside. It would impact elementary reconfiguration possibilities because we're taking pieces of other buildings that we might not otherwise need. And the element, elementary buildings uh, would have to be updated to meet licensing requirements, and those specific costs are unknown at this point. The state has pretty stringent requirements in terms of licensing uh, any facility, and if we moved them into the elementary buildings, those elementary buildings would have to be modified to meet those requirements. Third, uh, can, uh, pr I'm sorry, third option with respect to the preschool program would be to relocate all preschool programs to a pre-K-1 building. Um, Plant Moran talked about two elementary buildings. In, in this option, one of those buildings would be a preschool, kindergarten, first grade, and the other building would be second, third, fourth, fifth grade. Um, in that kind of an option, it would put all the elementary childhood students together on one campus, preschool, kindergarten, first grade. Saves the operational costs of both Grant and Harding, about 300 grand. It allows for expansion of the program, and in that scenario, again, the district would provide busing, and you'd provide a year-round wraparound child care program for parents and students within the district. Going too fast here. University High School, again, Plant Moran said, you know, um, the vision is that University High School would remain an entity unto itself. Um, one option is to maintain the current facility. Leave it where it is, don't do anything with it. Another option could be move UHS to the Coolidge Building. It's closer to the high school, um, has a separate gym and a cafeteria, and it's still convenient for commuters. Taft has fewer rooms and gym is the same size, therefore there would be no benefit to looking at Taft as there is to Coolidge. Coolidge is one of your newer facilities and one of the best ones you have. Those are options to look at, but the key is UHS is uh, deemed to be uh, essential to maintain a separate location. As you look at Ferndale High School and Ferndale Middle School configuration, uh, the suggestion is you look at moving all of the sixth graders to the middle school. They would save about a half million dollars a year. Uh, from a, a, an achievement perspective, what would that do? It would concentrate the efforts to welcome new sixth graders and students into one campus and build a strong school culture here on this one campus. Uh, students would be instructed by teachers who have subject area expertise as opposed to a homeroom teacher that has more general uh, knowledge in all subject areas. Most middle schools across the state and across the country are configured on a grade six, seven, and eight basis and taught by subject as opposed to grade level. Sixth grade teachers would collaborate with secondary teachers uh, through weekly professional learning community sessions so that there would be closer networking between staff along the way. You'd have increased elective offerings for sixth grade students. They'd be exposed to uh, different career choices. And all sixth graders would have the chance to take uh, band, orchestra, art, or choir because with them all being together, you can get more efficiency out of those special staff. From a sustainability perspective, um, there are currently 14 empty rooms here at this, con here at this uh, campus. And so the movement of sixth grade in could easily be accommodated with the empty classroom buildings that are there. It allows the closing of an elementary building with about a half million dollar savings on an annual basis. And it allows savings by decreasing elective teacher travel and increasing scheduling efficiency along the way. From an equity perspective, all sixth graders would have equal access to programs, intervention, and honor level classes across the district because they're all on one campus. Would allow for a more systematic approach for intervention and or enrichment for students. And advanced students would have the option of taking higher high school level classes earlier, and therefore, as they matriculate onto the high school, would have more access to uh, college level courses being offered at the high school campus. All proposed elementary school models in any event 
would have to entail increased academic rigor. It goes back to the issue that Joanne talked to you about. It would have to have um, technology integrated and embedded into each of the buildings. Part of the existing bond issue is allocated for technology. There would have to be specials and circuits that are put in place. No matter what configuration is chosen, the district needs to make sure that they provide significant opportunities for kids at all levels for those specialized programs and services. Special education services are mandated by law and right to be provided for kids who have special needs uh, across the district. Um, it would allow for student-led conferences and data folders and greater social and emotional development in any configuration that the district chooses. These are things that we believe need to be built into that existing elementary program. Um, in those proposed elementary models, we think that there's clear research that says these three things are important for all kids, that learning be project-based, that there be expanded parent and volunteer options across the district, and that all kids have some exposure to outdoor education. Um, as we look at all of those um, elementary options, clear that the district needs to establish a volunteer office, someone who can coordinate the volunteer efforts across the district, someone who would work with the entire community, um, and, and a volunteer board would be established to work with that person. The purpose would be to teach our children the importance of being part of a community, giving back, uh, understanding that as a member of a community, you have an obligation to, to be an active part of that community. It would teach our children the value of helping others, uh, it would help reinforce, we hope, the concept that kindness matters at every age. And in addition to that, very specific parent-run programs would exist at all schools. Under elementary configuration number one, you wouldn't do anything. But if you choose that option, there are some issues that you have to confront that, that are in direct conflict with your strategic place plan. If you do nothing from a sustainability standpoint, it's going to take the district into a deficit. From an achievement perspective, there'll be less money put into the classroom, class sizes will rise, et cetera, et cetera. And from an equity perspective, it doesn't address any of the current equity issues identified in the strategic plan. For these reasons, we don't believe that this is an option that the district can look at from a viable perspective. From an elementary configuration two perspective, and we've just put numbers on these because we see these as options, would be to have two K-5 programs that are program-based. Two elementary schools, each grades K through five, that would be based on specific programs. For example, you're looking at a Cambridge program at one elementary. You've got another program that's been in, in existence for a long time that could be another option at the other school. Two program-based options. Um, you would use a constructivist model, uh, an updated open concept uh, at one, and the other one would be uh, perhaps a 21st century international school program. Those are the two program-based theories that might be in place. In terms of the constructivist model, it would promote student-centered learning, provides differentiated learning through a workshop model, uh, promotes rigorous self-directed learning, small group flexible learning, multi-grades, K1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, outdoor education opportunities, and not a heavy reliance on textbooks, most heavily on project-based. In terms of the 21st century international model, it would promote academic rigor in English, math, and science, maybe a STEM program provides a flexible curriculum framework that promotes creativity for students, emphasizes thinking skills as well as inquiry-based learning, measures student progress based on international bench benchmarks, um, promotes a global focus while promoting cultural sensitivity, prepares students for middle school and high school Cambridge and advanced placement courses, and a math science application through Project Lead the Way. Again, these are concepts and things that we think would be essential to be integral to whatever option the board chooses. And you can see that there are pluses and minuses with each and every option. 
in uh, configuration two, parents would choose between the two programs. Do you want the international program? Do you want the constructivist model? Which one do you want? Neither school would close to enrollment unless all classrooms were filled. Everybody would have equal access. Students could transfer between programs if room is available, and siblings would automatically attend the same school. I want to go back to that last piece. There would only be a lottery if there's no room in the first choice school. If there's room, students have access to it. From an achievement perspective, it provides instruction for all learning styles. Professional development teachers would be embedded in the school culture. Both K-5 schools would be based on extensive research. An opportunity for more systemic interventions and enrichment would be in place. From a sustainability standpoint, could end up being overstaffed versus other models due to parent choices of programs. You may need to duplicate services, more staff in each location. Um, one building could have less services, et cetera. Uh, opening both programs equally will allow ability to equalize classes. One program may become significantly more popular than another, and it would be difficult to fit all students in that building, necessitating a change in buildings in the near future. We'd have two attractive options for current families and families of the future looking for research best-based practices and education to consider. From an equity perspective, there could still be perception of winners and losers if a parent doesn't get their first choice. If one building ends up with a higher percentage economically disadvantaged, then more resources will be allocated to that building. Uh, opening both programs equally will create a more equitable system that we currently have and creates two unique educational programs that could be understood by parents as opposed to our current system that has very few educational differences. A third option, <coughs> excuse me, two elementary schools, one that's a lower school, K-2 or pre-K, K-1, and an upper school, grades three through five or grades two through five, depending upon which lower school option is pursued. Be consistent with best practices in education for all students. It have honors and international programs for the upper students systemic interventions and enrichment for all grade levels, world language program being offered K-5, and Project Lead the Way Math Science application elective for uh, the upper school grade students. From achievement perspective, classroom instruction would be built on a combination of research and best practices, both constructivist and international standards, large grade level teams to work and plan together, they'd all be congregated together, uh, intervention and enrichment would be available to students equally, and we'd create a more seamless transition from Ferndale Elementary School, would function as one building with two campuses, same leadership model, procedures, processes, parents, et cetera. Sustainability, uh, ability to staff most efficiently. Uh, efficiency in staffing would allow for increasing elective offerings such as world languages, grades K-5 and a cause for concern for the community as we break from past practice and move into a newer educational model. Change causes concern, no question about it. From an equity perspective, there's no perception of winners or looters, losers because everyone's together. It follows the middle school and high school model where diverse student population prides itself on working together. Blake talked a little bit about how the high school students saw the diversity being the greatest strength that Ferndale education provided to them. Resources would be equally available for all buildings and would get rid of a need for a lottery that causes undue stress for incoming families. Moving forward, and this is what we are recommending that the district consider at this point, that for 2015-2016, that the district move central administration to Ferndale High School, that they close Jefferson, and that they make a decision on how they're gonna use grant one way or the other, and make a decision which of the two elementary buildings would stay online for 2016, 2017. So what we're saying is there don't do anything to change the elementary schools for the next school year, but use the 2015, 2016 school year to plan fully for the implementation of a new configuration in 16, 17, and which of the buildings to be chose we're not recommending at this point. <coughs> we think there needs to be more work done and more input received. 
and then finally make a decision on the location of University High School Adult Ed and Alternative Ed and do that this spring with a view towards implementation in 15-16. In 2016-2017, move the sixth grade to the middle school. Don't do that next year. Do it 16-17. Not at all the next school year, the year after. Implement the two elementary configuration, whichever choice is ultimately selected, whichever option is deemed to be the best fit for the Ferndale community and the, the congruence with the various components of the district, key, district strategic plan. And then thirdly, move UHS if it's so determined that that's the desire to move it to another location from its current location. So those are the, the real recommendations, those last two slides, what we really think the district ought to look at. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Blake, but before we do we have a question in the back? Yes, ma'am. No. No, not at all. Two buildings. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the some of the conflicts that we think need to be worked out, and why we're not willing to say at this point we think this option is preferred over that option. We think that there needs to be more study done on that. But as Blake said at the very outset, this is the start of a process. There have been no final recommendations made to the administration or to the Board of Education as to which buildings or anything like that. We're gathering data. You saw some data from Plant Moran Cressa. You saw some data in terms of the uh, academic component. You've seen some data as it relates to uh, the financial piece, the sustainability of the district, the equity issues. Those things all need to come together from the perspective of how do we provide the best overall program for all of the kids in Ferndale. That's the focus. Yes, sir. I would say in general they're higher. Um, that that's an issue. In general they're higher, and yes, those non-instructional pieces can be broken out and are broken out. But there's a lot to it. I mean, you, when you look at that district budget, it's it's not just two or three pages. It's hundreds. So what what we can do is make sure that we get some of that breakdown posted on the district's website, so you have access to all of that as well. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I would say that you know, from the perspective of the Leadership Institute, we're not willing to say one option over the other. But we're still looking at uh, strengths and weaknesses, and we've asked for some help from the buildings, the, the, the administrators, to help us identify those strengths or weaknesses as we, as we move forward. Uh, here's what we can tell you, is we see that this model does a lot of good things. Any of the models, create some consternation within the community and, and we clearly recognize it. It's a significant change for any building. But if people can approach this process from the standpoint of what we're really trying to do is strengthen the academic program for all of the kids in the district, every one of them, it becomes a matter of the people who are involved instead of the bricks and mortar that are involved. And and I would tell you that from the perspective of Plant Moran Cressa and from the Michigan Leadership Institute, as we have collaborated on this, um, 
we've done some research on the history of the district and the various buildings within the district, and we understand that there are some, some facilities that have really deep roots in this community, really deep roots, and are really important to various aspects of, of this school community. And um, we want to try to be respectful of those roots and considered of those roots and put together a recommendation ultimately that makes the most sense for everyone. Yes, way in the back. Sure. Sure, it, and, and I think that slide shows that in many instances, kids in various schools in Ferndale score higher than some neighboring schools with lower percentage of, of economically disadvantaged kids. And that's a real plus. And that's when, when you look at that graph, you need to look at what's to the left and what's to below each of those things to get some comparative information. Okay. Sure. Point taken. Sorry, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that for me? I didn't hear that. Yep. Yep. It, those are all things that, that are valid points that need to be looked at. No question about it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. We've looked at a lot of that, and we know that the, the best way to increase revenue is to be able to increase the number of students. And we know that there is a significant portion of resident kids that don't go to Ferndale schools. And so part of the process that the district's looking at is what can we bring from a programmatical and an instructional perspective to Ferndale that will encourage parents who live in this community to send their kids to school in this community. And then secondly, uh, we talked a little bit um, just briefly about the action that the board took last night to look at an early college program. I'm gonna let Blake talk about what those benefits would be and how they plays out to what you're talking about. So I, I'm gonna just turn it over to you at this point. who are currently here. They're here, those bodies exist, those kids are here, they live in Ferndale. They don't go to school in Ferndale. And so the first effort needs to be, we, we're not gonna say, you know, we need to, to go out and try to convince people to engage in activities that will generate a larger kindergarten class five years down the road. That's a tough sell, uh, <laughs> particularly in today's environment. But, but what we wanna do is say, you know, if you've got your uh, two, three, four, five-year-old kid living in this community, what can we do to make our program and our services more attractive to you as a parent so that you choose to send your kids to Ferndale instead of sending them someplace else?
yes and no. It depends on the specifics. Uh, you may be very right, and it depends a lot on the, the makeup, the demographic makeup of that student population to begin with. Uh, that's an issue that, that needs to be looked at. 